Honors College. This is our last lecture in our series, The Orators, which has been a new program this year for the Honors College. Some of you have been with me on this journey through asking, searching for self, who am I anyway? That's what we've been exploring this whole year. And in September, during Classical Week, we look towards the past to find some answers to who we are today. And then in November, we went with the help of the psychology department on campus. We sort of kind of figured out about what made us happy in search of happiness. And today, we move on celebrating Black History Month with discovering matters of ourselves. Self. Is there anybody here from the Mississippi Humanities Council? Well, they certainly have been wonderful to the Honors College and Mississippi State University. They have supported us financially with this program. Please know, if you look in your program, that our grant was made possible for this orator's program through the wonderful help of Mississippi Humanities Council, which also gets their support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. We also want to make sure that any views, findings, conclusions, recommendations expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities or the Mississippi Humanities Council. On my journey to work with the Orators Program, I have been able this year to work with many fine people in many different areas of this university. But I must say that Dr. Anthony Neal who is going to be introducing our special speaker for today has been nothing but outstanding helping me secure our speaker today. In just a few minutes, Dr. Neal will be introducing our speaker. He will be presenting our speaker. A wonderful presentation for you today, followed by a question and answer period where we want to hear from our students and faculty and staff and visitors. And then we'll have a reception after that. Food, yay! I'm sorry, what was that? Did we hear a giggle? <laughs> you can respond, okay? You can respond. Because after all, the programs that we do here at the Honors College is for our students. It's for you. So I'm glad that you are here and participating. We also will provide you with an evaluation instrument. So we'll get a written feedback from you on how we did today. And this information will be sent back to the Mississippi Humanities Council. And that will help us in programming for our future programs to provide this to you. See how all this works together. Dr. Neal, as your program suggests, goes by many titles here at the university. I call Dr. Neal with the title of colleague and my friend. So would you please say hello with a big hand of applause to Dr. Neal. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, so, this afternoon, I think we're in for a treat. Um, some of you who know a little bit about my past and knew, know that I worked at one point in engineering, left engineering to go back to school to become a philosopher. I did that because I wanted to live the life of the mind. And I wanted to be around people who wanted to live the life of the mind. And I think that the person that we're going to have before us this afternoon is a person who has been a consummate professional and a person 
life of the lion. Uh, Milton, Dr. Milton Rogers, excuse me, I, I, I consider him a friend also. Um, so he is a professor currently at Brown University, one of the Ivy Leagues. He has been at a number of institutions, Colton College, Swarthmore University of Virginia, and Emory University, which is where I met him. At Emory University, he was the first African-American philosopher at Emory University. We had a philosophy club, which I invite some of you to start um, clubs or reading organizations, reading groups, such that you can start you know, just dialoguing with text. We met once a week. We wrote papers and we presented them to each other. We were not kind in our uh, disagreement with each other, but we, we remained friends afterwards. And uh, we, were, we were sort of unhappy when, when Melvin broke the band up and went to UCLA. <laughs> but, um, so Melvin, one of the things that I find most interesting, so Melvin is a few years younger, I know that I look a lot younger than he does, but he's a few, <laughs> years, <laughs> he's a few years younger than I am. But in his um, short life, he's managed to do uh, some things that I find incredible, which is why I think it's so important for you to have him speak before you today. Before Melvin, uh, Dr. Rogers, there was uh, Westbrook, the Westbrook uh, book on Dewey, and there's also the John McDermott book on, on Dewey, John Dewey, uh, which is one of the most important American philosophers and American scholars of all time. Dr. Rogers has managed to write one of the preeminent texts on Dewey, such that Cornel West says on the back that the undiscovered Dewey is the best book on our greatest public philosopher since Robert Westbrook's classic text. It is one of those rare book works that would make John Dewey smile and Richard Rorty grin <coughs> from the grave. It is one of those things that if you are going to do anything on Dewey or on pragmatism, you have to read this book. And many scholars, those of us who are scholars, writers, things of that nature, we hope to have at least one book like that. And I think that that is one of the things, if you don't uh, remember anything else, you should remember that you had a chance to be in, one, in, in the presence of one of the preeminent scholars uh, on the subject of John Dewey. So I don't want to say a lot. I will just say that I consider Melvin uh, to be a consummate scholar. Look at his CV. Uh, he's done all of the things that you need to do. But I also consider him to be a friend. And one of the things that I think that is uh, wonderful about him, he's approachable. He's someone that you can run ideas by. He's someone who is concerned about teaching, so he's never left this idea that part of living the life of the mind is imparting, imparting knowledge. So please shower him with your questions, all right? Don't take it easy on him. Right. <laughs> and without much further ado, Dr. Melvin Rogers. So first of all, it is very nice to see all of you. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Clevenger. Um, I want to thank uh, um, my dear friend Anthony, um, Dr. Neal. Um, um, I, 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 I want to thank the dean and all of you for being here. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to work through a talk. Um, and there may be moments where we will feel like we've lost our way. There may be moments like that. And in truth, um, if I'm doing my job, we should feel at various moments that we lost our way. But if we stay together, um, I think we'll be just fine. Okay? We all good with that? All right, so let's get into this. So in dark water of 1920, W.B. Du Bois uh, offers an incisive commentary on the meaning of democracy. So against those who would restrict the franchise, the ability to vote. So against those who would restrict the franchise, he remarks, and this is Du Bois speaking here, such arguments show so curious a misapprehension of the foundation of the argument for democracy, that the argument for democracy must be continually restated and emphasized. So these people are confused, 
because they're standing against the franchise. And so Du Bois is, is saying we need to restate the very foundations of what democracy means. Now the statement is arresting given the historical setting. These words were penned by an African American in the 1920s at a time when the insecurity of black life was constantly on display, a period in which, despite the Civil War amendments, Jim and Jane Crow were the law of the land, and lynching was a daily reminder of how easily one could be disposed of with impunity. Needing to restate the case for democracy as Du Bois did across his varied career and life raises an important question that haunts and continues to haunt the struggle for racial justice. And that question is, what is it about democracy that justifies faith, especially the face of faith of African Americans in it? Given the frequency with which African Americans are killed by police relative to their population, the ongoing problems of economic inequality they experience, and the general sense that from city to city and state to state, black people are subject to a fundamental insecurity not chiefly of their own making, it is difficult to suggest that commitment is or has ever been justified at all. It may seem more appropriate to interpret the United States as working according to plan, connecting the horror of the earliest periods of African American life to the present moment in one story about the nation's presumed foundational commitment to anti-blackness. Writing, for example, in response to the 2012 killing of Trayvon Martin, journalist Tanisha Coates describes Martin's killing as the natural consequence of the proper functioning of American society. So this is what Coates writes, and listen to these words. When you have a society that takes at its founding the hatred and degradation of a people, when the society inscribes that degradation in its most hollowed documents and continues to inscribe hatred in the laws and policies, it is fantastic to believe that its citizens will derive no ill meaning. It is painful to say this, he continues. Trayvon Martin is not a miscarriage of justice, but American justice itself. This is not our system malfunctioning, it is our system working as intended. Now little can be denied, I think, in this, and we might add other voices who are trying to get us to see that anti-blackness functions, as some of them put, a precondition for American progress. <clears throat> as philosopher Calvin Warren tells us, quote, it is the humiliated incarcerated, mutilated, and terrorized black body that serves as the vestibule for the democracy that is to come." End quote. Calvin Warren stands in a tradition of thinking known as Afro-pessimism. Some of you may have heard this term. And it is a tradition that includes a variety of scholars, um, Jared Sexton, Frank Wilderson, and on some days, Saida Hartman. And all of them view the persistence of racial inequality and the vulnerability of black life as the inescapable afterlife of slavery, as they say. They raise the haunting suggestion that modernity, by which is meant that period running roughly from the glorious revolution to the American and French revolutions, but that modernity depends on the dehumanization and degradation of non-whites in order to understand and protect the identity, freedom, and progress of those who are white. This framework in which African Americans work, live, and struggle leads, as Juliet Hooker and Bernard Hess tell us, to a fundamental conundrum. This is how they put the fundamental conundrum of black politics. Quote, one of the fundamental paradoxes of black politics is the invariable futility, futility, 
of directing activism toward a racially governing regime historically founded on the constitutive exclusion and violation of blackness, end quote. So it is fashionable these days, and understandably so, to wear one's despair on one's sleeve. If we are honest with ourselves, how could we do otherwise? Moments of hope have often been dashed by the cold and cruel reality of American life. It is no wonder we find it hard to stabilize our faith in a racially just society. So here in brief is a sample of that history. It will be a sample and a crude version, but it gets to the essence of the point. In the wake of black Americans' participation in the American Revolution, the nation witnessed a slow denial of their standing and contribution to the polity. With the ongoing development of slavery in the South, northern states in the 19th century slowly rescinded rights that had previously been extended to African American men. Although the Civil War Amendment sought to recognize the equal status of blacks, that recognition was effectively denied by the ascendancy of debt peonage, economic exploitation, lynching, and Jim and Jane Crow. The Civil Rights Movement effectively killed Jim and Jane Crow, but the policing and subordination of blacks was reconstituted through the rise of the carceral state, the underdeveloped welfare state, and the underfunded public education system that has been exacerbated by re residential segregation. Whatever one might think of his success, the fact remains that the election of the first black president has been followed by a person who defines his success based on removing any traces of its previous occupant. The current president's success was, without exaggeration, cultivated through the tropes of white supremacy, nativism, and the commitment to police black and brown populations. Claims of white supremacy's death of the post-racialism that supposedly came with the ascendancy of Obama have proven premature. But at precisely this moment, even as I narrate this history, at precisely this moment, we must confront some important and I think critical questions. Questions about who we take ourselves to be. Is, it Amer is American democracy constitutionally at odds with our goals? Or might it be conducive to building a society in which we can live equally and at peace with one another? Are there normative resources on which one can rely to advance affirmative claims regarding racial equality resources, perhaps that are distilled from the story about the United States, the story of its constant struggles? Or must the resources of modern democracy remain forever premise, as some argue, on anti-blackness. Now admittedly, this, well, these appear to be empirical questions that seemingly depend on a story about history, or do they? In our historical calculus, we might emphasize the reconstitution of white supremacy, but we could just as easily emphasize the ways in which it has been foiled through multiple waves of racial inclusion. We could tell that story. Those who embrace the former, the story of the ascendancy and reconstitution of white supremacy, but those who embrace the former as our true racial reality, find themselves trying to prove to those of us who have benefited from racial struggle, while success is illusory or at best temporary. But those who locate America's identity and its resistance to white supremacy have another problem. They are often unable to see the evidence of systemic racism, or they readily describe it as anom anomalous, foreign to the structure of our institutions and our culture. If the first posture, the one that wants to insist on the reconstitution of white supremacy, if the first posture seems unsatisfying because it denies to us human agency and gives the past too much power over the present and future, the second, it seems to me, risks turning a blind eye to the ways white supremacy is often bolstered by institutional support and state-sanctioned violence that emanates from a culture of disregard, a culture right, that has historically developed and turns on disregarding black people. 
It seems to me both sides fail to distinguish between the somewhat different task of studying the past and narrativizing the past in a way that is useful for moving society in an auspicious direction. And Frederick Douglass's felicitous formulation of the matter, quote, we have to do with the past only as we can make it useful to the present and to the future. Now these words that I just, that I just gave you from Frederick Douglass, these words come from his famous 1852 address, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? And in that address, he does not dismiss the past, Rather, he stands in a line of thinkers, black thinkers, who see in America's past a vital principle that is both visionary and realistic. Similar to early 19th century abolitionist David Walker before him, and James Baldwin and Toni Morrison well after, Douglas tries to de deploy the principle of making and remaking that he believes underwrites the American polity, what we political theorists or political philosophers like to call the constituent power of the people. The idea of the people Douglas knows all too well forms part of the tradition of American life sitting alongside and often used to combat the white supremacist tendencies of the American polity. Douglas tries to retrieve this principle from the past and he counsels his fellows to place it in the service of the present and the future. For Douglas, African Americans may often be alienated from the American polity, but they are not alien to it. I think we often understate or ignore this point. African Americans often see their efforts as emerging from within and forming part of the very complex tradition of America, America's very complex um, moral and political language. Like them, Douglas aims to emphasize those portions of the tradition that might yet deepen and extend democracy against those portions that will constrain democracy's reach. So the meaning of America, its past and its future, is for Douglas something over which to struggle, but he sees struggle, and we should as well, as an emergent property of the contested notion of who comprises the people that is central to democracy's self-understanding. But the very idea of the people itself is a contested concept. And that idea of contestation is central to the very workings of democracy itself. So the question of what America really is seems to me to defy articulation even as we struggle to say something substantive about our ethical and political identity. This is simply because we cannot get on about the business of figuring out where we should go and who we ought to be without narrating the past to which we belong. But worrying too much, worrying too much about offering the true description or final narrative of that past may miss the point. We ask questions of the past, who are we really? Less to understand our identity once and for all and more to aid us in making decisions about who we should become. This is the aspirational quality of the American imagination, indeed the aspirational core on which African Americans have often relied as they have made appeals to the nation. This is, I believe, what we might call the perfectionist or romantic quality on which African Americans have relied and which Douglas has deployed again and again. So I want to spend the remainder of my time today trying to retrieve this complex meaning and to try to retrieve the power of this aspirational vision, believing that it is during moments of dark times, depending on one's politics, such as our current moment, you now know my politics, that we need to recall the faith of those that came before. But just as we have, in our current moment, reasons to give up on the American project, and reasons to believe in what the Afro-pessimists offer us, Douglas had in his time, 
a contrasting vision, a contrasting view that encouraged black people to abandon the American project. And so it is with this contrasting vision, the one that contrasts with Douglas's, what Douglas says, that we have to first begin. And it's a powerful vision expressed by the black nationalist, Martin Delaney. So just walk with me, okay? You all okay? All right. So a story. On the evening of December 13th, 1850, the faculty of Harvard's medical school met at the house, the home of then Dean Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. to discuss various petitions. And the petitions were related to the admission of three African Americans and one woman to the medical school, okay? Now, although Holmes had already granted admission to the students and the men would be allowed to attend for a semester, they were already in classes, the woman had already withdrawn, it was ultimately deemed, quote, inexpedient after the present course to admit colored students to attendance on medical lectures, end quote. Explaining his position, Holmes said in a letter of 1850, the faculty is now convinced, quote, that the intermixing of the white and black races in their lecture rooms is distasteful to a large portion of the class and injurious to the interests of the school, end quote. Now Holmes was expressing and affirming a vision articulated earlier by a group of students who attended Harvard Medical School. And he was articulating a resolution that these students had got together and passed amongst themselves. And here is what the resolution said. Listen to these words, this is from the students. Whereas blacks have been admitted to the lectures of the medical department of Harvard University, therefore resolved that we deem the admission of blacks to the medical lectures highly detrimental to the interests and welfare of the institution of which we are members, calculated alike to lower its reputation in this and other parts of the country, to lessen the value of a diploma from it, and to diminish the number of its students resolved that we cannot consent to be identified as fellow students with blacks whose company we would not keep in the streets and whose society as associates we would not tolerate in our houses." End quote. Martin Delaney, one of the four admitted students, left Harvard Medical School in March of 1851. He was not permitted to return. Only a few months earlier in September of 1850, the United States Congress had passed the Draconian Fugitive Slave Act an act that had strengthened the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793. Now in response to the 1793 version of the law, states such as Indiana and Connecticut made the right of jury trial upon appeal possible for escaped slaves, while states such as Vermont and New York provided escaped slaves with attorneys as well as making the jury trial a legal right. The 1850 law, the 1850 version, essentially destroyed all such possibilities, effectively denying, denying the standing of slaves even in free states, while also adding harsh penalties for those who either failed to enforce the law or who aided slaves to freedom. Now in Delaney's mind, you can imagine, these two moments mingled together. They each were a piece of a general logic of seeing African Americans as an inferior race. And in response, Delaney argues for immigration. His signature text, the condition, elevation, immigration, and destiny of the colored people of the United States, which was published in April of 1852, it really represents a powerful indictment of American life during this time. Delaney's argument for immigration emanates from a belief that the ethos of the country or its culture right, depends on the domination of black Americans. This is what Delaney means when he says, quote, we are politically not of them, but aliens to the laws and political privileges of this country. Delaney continues, 
These are truths, fixed facts, that quaint theory and exhausted moralizing fall harmlessly before, end quote. But there is something else at work in forming Delaney's position, that those who take up Delaney don't spend enough time with. Political life, he thinks, is merely the attitudinal expression of the underlying ethos or culture of the people. So listen to his words again. Among the whites, their color is made by law and custom the mark of distinction and superiority, while the color of the blacks is a badge of degradation acknowledged by statute, organic law, and the common consent of the people. With this view of the case, which we hold to be correct, to elevate to equality the degraded subject of law and custom, it can only be done by an entire destruction of the identity of the former condition of the applicant, namely black people. Now by identity here, Delaney has in mind the identity that is ascribed to African Americans by virtue of their race, what he calls the badge of degradation that is instantiated and acknowledged by his language, the political, legal, and cultural life of American society. The identity of white Americans partly comes about, or so Delaney is suggesting, by virtue of this contrast with their darker counterparts to overcome this condition, the condition that black folks find themselves in, requires that one destroy the badge of degradation. But this also involves, significantly, a willingness by white Americans to destroy the legal and customary badge of superiority they now flaunt. They must be willing to destroy, in Delaney's view, who they take themselves to be. That is to say, they must cease being white on his account. This would mean, were they to cease being white, this would mean, in Delaney's mind, the overthrow of the American Republic. Because he's suggesting that the American Republic is constitutively, fundamentally, bound to whiteness, a kind of whiteness that depends on the degradation of black people, right? So Delaney connects ethos or culture and politics together in a way that continues to haunt us today. He wants us to think that there is no meaningful distinction between the constituent power of the American people and its constituted form, the form of government and laws. And he wants us to believe that the people's cultural identity and its political identity cannot be separated or transformed. Now this is a bit of vocabulary from political philosophy. Constituent power, the power of the people, is the power for making and remaking society. The constituted expression, when we talk about constituted power, what we have in mind is the government and its institutions. And on Delaney's account, the constituted power derives its existence from constituent power. And this is typically how it is understood among philosophers and political theorists of his time. Constituent power functions as an autonomous domain that can be inhabited by anyone but never finally colonized. Now Delaney's gonna do something different here. So when we talk about constituent power, we tend to think of men and women across American history working outside the formal domains of power, outside the formal institutions of politics. So when we think about the abolitionist movement, the women's rights movement, the civil rights movement, right? We're thinking about people who are working outside the formal structures of power. So the constituent power of the people seemingly stands apart from its constituted form, giving it direction all the while preventing constitution, constitutional power, constituted power from firmly speaking in its name. So let me sort of slow this down a little bit. The idea is that there is a domain of power when you and I step into the public domain. 
that that domain is a domain of power that is not to be identified with constitutive versions of power. Think about the law. Right? Think about our political institutions. And the idea is that because you have that domain, the constitutive form of power can speak in the name of the people, but it can never exhaust how it is talking about the people. Why? Because we never know who's in this, this space of power, this domain of power. And the idea is that this space here can bring pressure to bear on the constituted form of political life. So we think about the, the abolitionist movement bringing pressure to bear on political institutions. We think about the women's rights movement doing the same, the same thing. Now for Delaney, and this marks him off in a different way, I think, the identity of the American people, he tells us, has no distinct or prior political existence. The identity of the American people is found in its constitutional order that materially manifests its otherwise fixed identity. Now this way of proceeding is what allows Delaney in 1852 to view the Fugitive Slave Act as he does and is what allows Coates in 2013 from the quote cited earlier to say that Trayvon Martin is not a miscarriage of justice but American justice itself. This is not our system malfunctioning, it is our system working as, it in, as intended. And of course it's the great crime of our country that we're able to sort of use Delaney's language in a way that seems very familiar, that seems very relevant now. Right? But what Delaney is essentially saying is that there is no space that is distinct from its constitutional, its constituted expression. So when we get the Fugitive Slave Act, when it is passed into law, it is merely a representation, an expression of the constituted form of these people here, namely white Americans. So Delaney's view opened up an important disagreement between him and Douglas. And here is what Delaney says of his position to William Lord Garrison in 1852. Listen to Delaney one final, yeah, I think one final time. Quote, I am not in favor of caste, not in favor of separation of the brotherhood of mankind, and would as willingly live among white men as black if I had an equal possession and enjoyment of privileges. Blind selfishness on the one hand and deep prejudice on the other will not permit them to understand that we desire the exercise and enjoyment of rights. If there were any probability, if there were any probability, I should be willing to remain in the country fighting and struggling on, but I must admit that I have no hope in this country, no confidence in the American people, with a few excellent exceptions. Therefore, I have written as I have done." So Douglas responds a year later to this sentiment, and this is what Douglas writes. We don't object to colonizationist plans, and the colonizationist plans were essentially these plans of immigration that Delaney had for black people to get up and go. So Douglas says, we don't object to colonizationists because they desire the prosperity of black Americans, but it is because, like Brother Delaney, they have not sufficient faith in the people of the United States to believe that the black man can ever get justice at their hands on American soil. Now there are two themes here that I want to highlight. The first is a slide from hope in Delaney's language to faith and Douglas's. The second bears on the invocation of the people that Douglas is using in this passage, okay? So let's deal with each one, right, in turn. So let's deal with this, sl this slide from hope to faith first. So the language of hope and faith, they're not, they're not synonyms. So hope, as Patrick Shade notes, is, quote, an active commitment to the desirability and realizability of a certain end. This is hope. And so it appears that for someone like Delaney, that hope is tied to confidence in bringing to fruition what he desires. That's why he uses the language of probability. 
As he suggests, hope stands within the world of probabilities, informed by facts that provide indications of what is possible. We must abandon, he says, you will recall, all vague theory and look at facts as they really are. But Delaney takes the facts, at least in 1852, to be exhaustive not only of what is, but what in fact may be. In contrast to hope, faith is a passionate conviction that is coterminous with a vision of life or object that is not in existence. Now take note, both hope and faith, as you can tell, are tied to something that is not yet in existence. Both are longing for something. But the source of difference between the two is that hope marks levels of confidence in achieving what is desired, while faith appears to be the expression of a loving, even if difficult, commitment, precisely because there's no confidence to be had, at least based on some facts of the matter, in its realization. This at least appears to be how these two things hang together. So Delaney not only dispenses with hope because there's no evidence to sustain it, but more significantly, he is without faith that one can craft a vision of American and African-American life that can provoke white Americans to change, to dispense with the status they seemingly enjoy by virtue of being white. Now in contrast, all Douglas had is faith. In 1852 address, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, Douglas holds fast to the idea that he can put the revolutionary spirit of 1776 in the service of a racially just society that has never before defined American life. He thinks that inhabiting this revolutionary spirit of changing and remaking things and putting it in the service of a racially just society will be so compelling that his fellows will have no other choice but to follow. He holds fast to the idea that America, oddly, is false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds herself to be false to the future. So then, Douglas, what are you doing if you think that the revolutionary spirit can transform this? Now, I want to be careful with using this, this sort of you know, false to the past and false to the present and false to the future in Douglas. And I want to be careful because rhetorically, Douglas often speaks in a way to try to elicit from you the opposite of the claim that he's making. But the fact remains is that in a speech where he seemingly is trying to get white Americans to change, he nonetheless says that you're false to the past, false to the present, and will be false to the future. Now sometimes it is Douglas's religious commitments at work that inform his faith. Right in the wake of Dred Scott decision, he tells us that Justice Taney, quote, may decide and decide again, but he cannot reverse the decision of the Most High. He cannot change the essential nature of things, making evil good and good evil. That's a religious claim. Other, time, other times, Delaney's faith, uh, excuse me, Douglas's faith is tied to a vision of human nature. So sometimes when he talks about faith, what he really has underneath it is a story about how we are as human creatures. So he says, man is likely or liable to do evil, and he is still capable, nonetheless, of apprehending and pursuing that which is good. This is in 1851. He thinks it's part of our nature to be this way. But more consistently, I think it is faith and a specific idea of America. In other words, it's not the religious faith that's finally informing him. It is not his story about the malleability of our nature that's finally informing him. But finally, what seems to underwrite this faith of his is a certain kind of idea of America itself. Whatever then is hoped for by Douglas seems to have no other ground, no other foundation, no other basis than this idea of America itself and this is what he tells us in that 4th of July address. I therefore leave off where I began with hope while drawing encouragement from the Declaration of Independence, the great principles it contains, and the genius of American institutions. And he repeats the sentiment in his Dred Scott address of 1857. For Douglas, hope and faith come together 
in a way similar to, let's say, Hebrew 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So how should we finally understand this account of faith? What is it really, I've made all these moves, what does it really amount to? So as I read Douglas, his account of faith is basically tantamount to a vision of political and ethical life that is at variance with the way society is structured, what America fails to be true to, as he says. But it is a vision of life that he believes can and ought to guide our lives and for which he is willing to struggle, even if it means putting his life on the line. Now this view marks an important difference between himself and Delaney, and I think between those who are pessimists regarding racial transformation and those who are keepers of the faith. Delaney treats the facts of racial domination as he sees it in 1852. He treats the facts of racial domination as capturing the way the world really is in itself. He thinks those facts are expressive, he tells us at one point, of a deeper historical logic that is merely playing itself out in the United States. As he says, in condition, they have always been in all ages and all countries. Classes of people who have been deprived of equal privileges, these are historical facts that cannot be controverted, end quote. Now take note here, Delaney does not merely provide us with a description of the past, in his invocation of historical facts. Rather, he subsumes history under natural processes, he's, uh, natural processes. He's essentially saying that what we see in the logic of racial domination is the expression of natural processes that we can only get to through the study of history itself. The facts cannot be controverted because they define, essentially, the temporal field of the past, the present, and the future. And just as Delaney subsumes history, absorbs history into nature, we see, we see a similar move, I think, in someone like ta Coates, who I cited at the beginning of this talk, writing in 2015 in his book, I don't know if you've read this book, Between the World and Me, Coates argues that white supremacy is, quote, a force of nature. And then on the heels of that claim, that it's a force of nature, he reminds us that black Americans are, quote, the helpless agents of our world's physical laws. White supremacy now is understood as an expression of the physical laws of nature. I didn't know it worked that way. But so much for human agency, right? Now, Douglas rejects this kind of thinking. He refuses to remove the human element from the facts of American history, and he thinks that since the human element isn't the kind of thing that is fixed once and for all, there is no reason to think that the future need only be a replication of the past. To recall a line cited earlier from his 1851 essay, Is Civil Government Right? While man is constantly liable to do evil, he is still capable of apprehending and pursuing that which is good. When Douglas speaks this way, I often think of later figures. Um, 20th century figure, 19th, 20th century figure, Anna Julia Cooper. And I think of the American pragmatists as defending this account of faith and holding this view of human beings as unfinished creatures. It is important to understand that this sort of description of faith and description of human nature and the need to make use of it is heightened in dark times and explains why Douglas's faith remains important, I think. Cooper tells us, Anna Julia Cooper tells us, that faith is neither a proper interpretive enterprise of scripture nor a process of trying to stabilize theological certainties. She was religious, but she was uninterested in having the logic of faith confined to religion. As she argues in A Voice from the South, 1892, Faith involves submitting oneself, and this will sound familiar, submitting oneself to a vision of life that one projects into a world at odds with that vision and for which one is willing to act in the service of. But she wasn't alone. We hear the echo of this position in William James in 1897. In his account of faith, right, he says that faith need not be at odds with the world, 
but its end is in no way assured. Quote, faith is the readiness to act in a cause, the prosperous issue of which is not certified to us in advance. And thinking about faith in this way, I do not mean to suggest to you that faith isn't disciplined and that it isn't humbled. Faith talk is often assumed to be a species of irrational thinking because it is often assumed necessarily to be a species of religion. And all of that reveals a kind of stance on the part of the listener, a kind of stance toward religious people. But I tend to think this way of understanding the matter, faith as irrational, is mistaken, precisely because it does not take seriously how faith is so carefully disciplined. It is disciplined because the vision of life that faith holders offer is often pulled from, distilled from, the bits and pieces of the social and political community's language that is then reconfigured, unified, and projected forward into a, a novel pattern of life. Right? African American thinkers and activists, it seems to me, who stand with Douglas often organize the language of struggle and appeal in such a way that really disclose new meanings right? and the reach of those new meanings. So African Americans have reworked, for example, the interior logic of freedom, to just give you some examples. To be free was not only about having one's political standing rein reinstated. Think of the American colonists, right? Freedom was about having one's stand standing that you previously enjoyed reinstated or reaffirmed. So for black folks, it wasn't just about that. But freedom was also having one's capacity for freedom affirmed. And that's a difference, isn't it? This enables some to see that addressing the conditions of black people in the United States would take more than legal and political changes. The legal and political changes were very necessary for the American colonists because they were trying to have a freedom that they previously enjoyed reinstated. So this involved reconfiguring an institution, i.e. founding a new society. But black folks realized that legal and political changes weren't enough. Deep transformations of culture in which negative and debilitating images of black people and their capacities circulated would have to also be changed. What Ida B. Wells famously referred to as the unwritten laws of American life that police and condition the boundaries of black and white life. David Walker, a 19th century abolitionist, engaged in this reworking when he appealed to the very important capacity of black Americans, the capacity of judgment. And he wanted to tell us that your standing as a citizen is not bound up with, co with constitutional norms. It is not bound up with legal affirmation, but it is tied fundamentally and primarily to your very capacity to judge the world around you. And David Walker wanted us to see that this appeal to judgment is not novel to black Americans but was the very same thing that the colonists relied on as they made their appeal to the British crown. I don't need you, they said to the king, to affirm my political standing because my very capacity to judge is the site of my freedom. And now what I will go on and do is have it institutionally affirmed through the refounding of the country. And so someone like David Walker was encouraging his audience to think of political standing as not in the final analysis something that depends on constitutional affirmation, but as an outgrowth of our basic capacity to judge. Martin Luther King Jr. did the same thing. He famously engaged in the reworking of language when he retells the story of the founders and when he makes black folks part of the intended heirs of the ethical and political goods of the Declaration. In each instance, Black people were imagining against a tide confronting a world at variance with their vision, but nonetheless committed to the power of the new language they were offering. Although the imagination obviously is at work in this process, this refashioning, the resources of the imagination are not imaginary. To stick with the examples above, ideas of freedom, judgment, and the founders were already active within the culture. Faith in this regard, when it's tied up with the imagination, when it tries to express itself in the world, 
is a reality for the faith holder. It orients them in space, it moves them through time, and it influences their ethical and political choices. I mean, this is why Ralph Waldo Emerson tells us that faith makes us and not we it. Faith makes its own forms. The faith has a way of creating the very thing that is longing to instantiate in the world. And faith holders only long for the rest of their fellows to see its worth, the worth of the vision they're offering, its significance and its contribution to human flourishing. But the action of the faith holders are also, you know, they're also humbled by the fact that what they offer is dependent on those over whom they do not exercise final control and people who they nonetheless depend on for their life chances. This is partly why Douglas worked so hard in his Fourth of July address to shame and ridicule his audience, attempting to move them into a position of moral rectitude. This is why King, Martin Luther King, often uses America's love affair with the founders as a way of eliciting from them something the founders never intended or imagined. If we centralize dependence on our fellows and take seriously the absence of control, faith always bespeaks the uncertainty that saturates human experience. Uncertainty, you see, determines not merely the origin, but more critically, the career of what is longed for, what we desire, love and value. Faith always involves us with some confidence and self-assertion, but that self-assertion and confidence is always bound up with uncertainty because the realization of one's faith is dependent on one's fellows. So walk with me these final few steps. You all okay? All right, final few steps. So what of the other aspect of, uh, aspect of Douglass's thinking, his reliance on the idea of the people? We've dealt with this business about hope and faith. When Douglass appeals to the revolutionary spirit of 1776, he is appealing to what we might call the logic of democratic legitimacy. I'm going to explain this in a moment. And what he's suggesting to us is that the logic of democratic legitimacy is itself dependent on a principle of openness. And you might say, well, okay, how are all these things going together? Okay. So legitimacy is not a way for Douglas of talking about adherence to a de facto polity, a polity that already exists, but a way of marking the principle of revision and invention that can connect what the polity is to what it may be. And connecting the polity, what it is, to what it may be, and doing this all within the norms and the languages, the languages that the community is already familiar with. So Douglas is asking his fellows to channel the spirit of 76 so as to give life to a vision of themselves not yet in existence. And he is treating the people as not that thing that is specified finally by the Constitution, but as an aspiration struggling to inhabit the world. It is not, he explains, in changing the dead form of the union that slavery is to be abolished in the country. Rather, it is in changing ourselves. Slavery lives in this country, he continues, not because of any paper constitution, but because of the moral blindnesses of the American people who persuade themselves that they are safe though the rights of others may be struck down. And with some modification, we could use this language today. Both in 1852, and in his various speeches in 1856 and 1857, Douglas is asking his fellows to become the vision of themselves that he imagines. And they can do this by using the very principle of openness deployed by their parents to remake themselves in American society. Remember I told you that space that people stand in that's open, any one of us can stand in it? Well, if any one of us can stand in it, that's only because it remains perpetually open. When Douglas makes this move, he is refusing to concede ground on what this fragile experiment called American democracy is and who comprises it. And there is insight, I think, in Douglas's thinking. I'm often struck 
and maybe you are too, by the claim that white supremacy fundamentally defines the polity and that anti-blackness fundamentally defines America. And I want to be very careful here. I'm not struck by this because I think it's untrue, it actually is true, but I'm struck by it because this claim is often presented as exhausting the traditions we find ourselves living. But when you accept this claim about white supremacy, and you accept it as exhausting the identity of what America is about, then it seems to me that the struggle against racial domination can only appear as external to as alien to America's ethical and political life, rather than being those parts of the richness and complexity of that life trying to win the day. It's this point that I think remains the enduring insight of Douglas. Now, Douglas is not trying to offer a description of faith that he thinks is radically different um, or more superior to what Delaney offers. Douglas, in other words, is not trying to offer up a different historical account or narrative to combat Delaney's view. Rather, Douglas sees the full meaning of American democracy as exceeding the facts to which we can readily appeal. And he thinks that what America is exceeds the facts because the underlying logic of American life carries with it this principle of openness, this principle of openness that tells us that what America is is an unsettled and contested category. And this principle of openness seems to fit with a view about humans as unsettled and unfolding creatures. And since we stand within rather than outside human affairs, the choices we make matter a great deal for bringing about progress or obstructing it altogether. Now, of course, from the perspective of the 19th century, the past is bleak from the perspective of the 19th century. And of course, from the perspective of the 19th century, the future seems dim. And I would say that for us today, at least for me, our past is bleak and our future is dim. And were Douglas and I reasonable people, we would join Delaney and the Afro-pessimists in thinking that the facts of the matter settle things. This country does not care for black people and never will, right? if we were reasonable people. Well, let me ask you a question. When has democratic transformation in this or any other nation come about because of reasonable people? As Toni Morrison tells us, a reasonable man adjusts to his environment, an unreasonable man does not. All progress depends on the unreasonable man. All progress depends on the faith holders, women and men, who are not irrational, but who are most certainly unreasonable. When Delaney decides to collapse constituent power into constituted power, he denies not only himself, but American society a means of accounting for its own development whether that development relates to race relations or some other matter. It ignores that the constitution of the people is not a historic event fixed in time once and for all. Rather, the people is an ongoing claim that we make and is contested. And this underwrites these specific appeals we find historically excluded groups advancing throughout American history. We see it today. There is no way to make sense of the movement for black lives apart from this account. And so in contrast to Delaney, this troubles the ease with which we treat those recognized by the Constitution as settled and instead allows us to bring those at the margin to the center of analysis in America's unfolding moral and political drama. When Douglas speaks to the polity calling it to embrace new configurations of itself, he does so precisely because he relies on this logic of legitimacy, this logic of openness. And I'm inclined to say that we should do the same. Now this emphasis on remaking, reinventing, and openness in the service of the future that I have emphasized in Douglas may give the impression that he means for us to turn away from the past. And if I've given that impression, I apologize. Douglas thinks too much about the past. He agonizes over it. Douglas does not mean for us to break with the past. Rather, in James Baldwin's language much later, he wants us to enter into battle with it to enter into battle with the people history has created. And he wants us to recreate ourselves 
according to a principle more humane and more liberating. And in doing so, we may just achieve a level of personal maturity and freedom which robs history of its tyrannical power and also changes the history we come to live because it will have changed us. We struggle to live together as democratic citizens because I think we have not always understood the art of allowing portions of ourselves to die. What Douglas and Baldwin share is the belief that a democratic society is partly measured by the ability of its citizens to let go of their former selves as they quest after selves that are larger, more capacious, and more inclusive. We hear today from all corners that the sun is setting on the American empire. This will be familiar to you. Well, we must ask ourselves, it seems to me, is why resist this? It seems any empire, every empire that has existed has left death and destruction in its wake. So what we must ask ourselves, the true question, the question that Douglas put to his fellows in his day is what in our past might we retrieve for our present? How might those resources be reimagined to articulate a faith more humane and just than the reality we find ourselves living? And how might we allow portions of ourselves to die with grace so that we might live and grow into the beauty of the faith that we live by? Answering this question requires us to begin, as Douglas did, with the final idea, and perhaps the beginning idea, that who we are need not determine who we may yet become. I'll stop there. I don't know if we have a choice here, do we? And, and by that, I, I just simply mean that um, to sort of stand with the second question right, is to already suggest that we shouldn't be in this room talking about this subject matter. Right? So I tend to, and that's not the claim that I sort of think somewhat naively that King's dream will, will sort of be realized, um, but it is to say that King as a sort of faith holder and the details of his uh, account of the dream, which got co sort of complex over the time of his life, right before his death, um, is still a vision around which we ought to organize our lives. Right? All right, someone else. Yes, sir, please stand in. Um, in your presentation, you discuss black culture. I have a question. What exactly is black culture, and can it be defined? Uh, no, uh, and I'm not especially interested in trying to uh, define. I mean, we can mark out uh, certain literary and music forms, right? We can mark out a certain kind of relationship to uh, Christianity, um, and we can sort of use those as a basis to uh, uh, lay out the silhouette 
of uh, the kinds of cultural commitments that blacks seem to um, that blacks seem black Americans seem to traffic in. That of course will be different in in in, in various ways. Black Northerners, Midwesterners, Westerners, Southerners, right? So we don't want to sort of we don't want to sort of fixate on on that. What we do want to fixate on is actually the culture that we sort of share together, right? Uh, a sort of culture in which we sort of claim ourselves to be committed to the equal dignity of persons, a culture in which we claim to be committed to the sort of free exercise um, of, of speech and religion among persons, right? And we want to focus on the ways in which that seems to be dogged in various ways by a culture of disregard um, that I deployed through the language of white, of white supremacy. And then the question becomes, uh, how, how is it that we deal with this one, this one portion of who we are? Um, um, and might it be possible to narrate other sides of ourselves to discipline, constrain, perhaps remove um, this, the sort of darker portions of who we take ourselves to be, right? So many asks. Yeah, there you go. All right, so um, earlier you said... Uh, a little louder, a little louder. Sorry, earlier you said progress is made by, uh, the is made by the unreasonable man, mm -hmm. yet like the unreasonable, yet the rational man. Mm -hmm. How does any single unreasonable man go about bringing about that progress? Well, in fact, it doesn't happen that way, right? So uh, Morrison's invocation of the unreasonable man man his fu function as a kind of corporate term, a collective term, right? So, so, so in fact, one is not going to bring about radical transformation um, with, one, with one figure alone, right? It sort of depends on the collective energies of persons, but it depends on Morrison's account working backward to Douglas, it depends on people who are willing to articulate a faith that stands against and in excess of the reality they find themselves living. This is why it's called unreasonable. Right? Because, the, because the grounding of a reasonable belief, a grounding based on the evidence of the case, would in fact suggest that one ought to stand with, with someone like Martin Delaney or in contemporary times the Afro, the Afro pessimist. Right? So to circle back to the, to the question, this must, as it has always been um, in the struggles for equality and inclusion, um, this is a collective affair. Right? so much for that talk. I, I just, I love every minute of it. It's such a um, stirring affirmation of Douglas. Um, and, and I found myself, though, thinking about Plato, and thinking about the Republic, and for West students in this class, we've read the Republic. Um, and what I heard was a defense of this unreasonable it reminds us of Obama and Hope, right? As this kind of like unreasonable optimism in the possibility of progress despite the facts in front of us. But how do we get from there to faith in democracy specifically against the very reasonable argument of someone like Plato, who suggests that democracy will eventually lead us through this kind of indulgence and appetite mm -hmm. to tyranny. Right, so uh, democracy, democratia, is ruled by the people, essentially, right? Um, ruled by the people, presumably in the service of the interests of the people. And in the context of a modern society where uh, we live in a representative system, one of the things we want to be concerned about is whether or not those who speak in our name are in fact tracking our interests. But we also want to be sensitive to the fact that the society to which we live is dynamic. There are people articulating claims that actually have no representatives. And so part of the great beauty of the sort of modern emergence of democracy was to divide the idea of rule by the people, right, its institutional form, from the idea that the people are the sovereign makers or creators of society to divide these two, 
so that you could have institutions that always will invoke the people. We're speaking in the name of the people, but we resist the temptation to think that in speaking in the name of the people, we've fully exhausted, fully tracked, fully captured, right, the, the population that defines the polity. So now we've opened up people who are ruling, right? The people who are ruling are tracking some interests. Those interests may or may not track the people, right? Um, that, are, that are here on the ground, that are not in representative spaces, right? The idea of modern democracy on this account then means that the reason why one would place faith in democracy is not because of the institutional configuration that speaks in the name of the people, but because that institutional configuration is laid upon this space that is meant to remain perpetually open. So when I said in a very um, odd way that political legitimacy is not determined by de facto institutions, most people would say, well, that doesn't make sense. We think the system is legitimate. That is to say, it is worthy of my uh, respect uh, and adherence because it makes good on things that we are seeking, right? But we know that the system fails all the time in making good on the things that we're seeking, right? And so what we really are attracted to is the flexibility of the system, right, to correct itself. And that has everything to do with the principle of openness, right? So to circle back then to the, to the question, that's the reason why, right, one would place faith in democracy is precisely because its very workings, its lifeblood is de dependent on this principle of, of openness, which as we know, black folks came to exploit, but it wasn't just black folks exploiting it. The, the, the language at the time that was being used was not democracy, republicanism, we don't need to quibble over the historical details of this, but essentially the colonists and the founders were making, were making use of this principle of openness as well. Right? And so my sense is that that's, this is why one would, you know, this is why one would want to place faith in, in this, right? Um, and of course, this is gonna be bound up with other things about the malleability of who we are. So humans are not fixed creatures, we could be otherwise. A full-throated version of this would have to deal with, if you were interested in a full-throated, right, we would have to deal with institutional obstacles that obstruct the ability of people to remain open, right? Institutional uh, obstacles that incentivize people uh, not uh, to be open to the claims of their fellows. Right? So there's a whole bunch of protections and enjoyments and securities that come with whiteness. And I'll be quite honest, I, always, I say this to my students, I don't know if I was a white person, I would willingly want to throw it off given the, the goods that I enjoy by virtue of being white. I don't know that I would want to throw it off. I hope I would. I can't say I would, though, right now. Right? And I say that only to part, partly capture the seduction right, of uh, a, certain kind of, a certain kind of idea about, about, about sort of what it is to sort of stand in a space that, that sort of shields you from a set of existential angst and that carries with it a set of goods. So I'm not talking about a specific white person. I'm talking about a way of seeing a category that we come to live and inhabit. Right? I don't know if, right? And so, the, and so then there's a whole series of, we're gonna give a full throated version of this, we gotta deal with a whole series of institutions and ways of being that incentivize us from not throwing off whiteness. And I can tell you, um, there are ways of thinking about whiteness in which black people can come to traffic in its use, right? That's a whole nother argument. Where do you place the, uh, so the idea of constitutionalism as a means of protecting mm -hmm. from the tyranny of the majority? Mm -hmm. And where do you place that as an institutional tool mm -hmm. to hear the voices of those who may be coming into the open space mm -hmm. and have their right to Right, yeah, so I think, I think, you know, constitutionalism is very important, right? It, it becomes 
the sort of institutionalized um, channels through which the voices of those moving and shuffling around in the public space, right? It becomes the institutional channel by which that group can articulate um, and have their grievances materially embodied and addressed. So I wouldn't want to throw out constitutionalism as much as I'm also saying that culture matters a great deal. But the reason why I typically de-emphasize the reliance on constitutionalism, even as I recognize its importance, and it has everything with what, what, what King has to say about this, that King is right, that, that, that law cannot uh, uh, transform the heart, it can't legislate morality, right? But what it can do is constrain the heartless. So we need law to engage in regulation and constraint um, uh, and prohibitions of activities and harms uh, or ha activities that will produce harms that we just want to, this is wrong, this is unacceptable. But King is also very clear that the law itself is working in the set of or in the name of values that stand behind that law. Right? Law is the teeth for those values, the defense for those values. And he's very clear that if, in fact, we're going to deal with racial matters, it will, have to, it will largely depend on persuading men and women to live by what is otherwise unenforceable. So we him and ha, year in, year out, about how it is at various moments we seem to move forward and then backslide on racial issues. Or we'll point to the laws on the books. And we have a good number of good laws on the books, but there's a great deal of work to be done. But we'll point to the good laws on the books and say, well, I can't figure out why it is. We haven't achieved the end that we desire with respect to racial justice. Right? And that is because we seemingly think, or we have come to think, I'll put it that we have come to think, that legal transformation does all of the work of transforming persons. And this is in some sense the confusion. So the aim is how in fact can we talk about constitutionalism alongside of, as being bound up with, as contributing to a story about cultural transformation, about who we take ourselves to be, right? And this is about, this is about us, you and I, feeling ourselves diminished, right? in the face of the persistence of racial disregard, feeling ourselves to be diminished. Not just that the law failed, but something about who we are has failed. This is a tall order, I admit, right? But it, is, but it, it, seems, to me be, it seems to me a path that we, have to, that we have to do more work in traveling. One last question. Yes, sir, and yes. we need to move on. Thanks very much, Dr. Rogers. Um, so I really like this idea of thinking with postures, right? Um, the way I see it, there's basically three postures. So you, you outline two at the beginning, the sort of the straight-jacketing sense of almost the inevitability of abuse. Um, second, the sort of blithe um, conviction that one can pick out positives from the historical record. And third, uh, what I take to be almost sort of a synthetic um, approach, this sort of um, Douglasian ability to both see the record of abuse and think um, of a capacity for change that will be beyond, right? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I really, I think, amazing job sort of picking out at least one in three um, in the historical <coughs> record, picking out precedents um, for this gridlock between postures, this sort of palette of postures. So my question would be twofold. Is first of all, how does change over time figure into this? That is to say, given the longevity of these postures, what is the track record of fate? And how does that figure into it, okay? And second of all, right, because the, the idea of fate that you're outlining, the sort of synthetic approach, this thinking with Douglas that you're outlining has a history. So how does, the, how does that history of this very stance come into play in terms of espousing that history um, or not? And second of all, and excuse the naivete of this question, um, but um, I guess what I'd be interested in is um, the, the sort of delaying to your 
uh, Douglas, the sort of opposite number to um, the stance you're outlining, the um, opponent of faith, right? The sort of uh, closed futurist, right? Mm -hmm. The pessimist. Um, at this moment, uh, how much in practice does the platform that they outline uh, differ from the platform of faith? Right, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, the language of track record of faith is a bit, is a bit weird, isn't it? Because I've, I've sort of conceptually tried to define faith in such a way that it will exceed uh, the facts of the case. And track record is always about the facts of the case. But let me say, right? Twenty nineteen isn't eighteen sixty five. I'm being a little glib here, but but it's not. Right? Um, and eighteen sixty five, you know, um, wasn't even eighteen fifty. Right? And I, you know, and I, you know, and I think we don't, you know, I think we don't make much of this in the right way. So we make much of this in the wrong way. And the wrong way is to say, see, this is an arc of our progress, where, where, where progress then will be cashed out in sort of material terms about um, how many blacks you have in higher education, um, how many are in the middle class, right? This is sort of the wrong way to sort of, to sort of cash that out because you could have all of those changes and still not have transformed the fundamental underbelly of, uh, of, uh, of the nation with respect to the standing of black, of black persons. And since you don't change the, the fundamental underbelly, then it always leaves opportunities for abuse, exploitation, and, dis and disregard, right? So, so I tend to want to say is that, look, there has been some progress, that the progress is indicative of our capacity we don't want to make much of this in terms of telling a story about, about progress. But what we want to recognize is that the progress that has been achieved has come about precisely because of the way in which faith has worked itself, right? Has worked its way, has worked itself out. We, right? Because faith is not fundamentally or it's not exclusively about the substance of the vision. It is also about the posture that one has to take toward the nation, a way of confronting the persistence of, of disregard, right? And so faith holders have a way of dealing with inevitable failures that they will encounter in their, in their fellows and dealing with that inevitable failure in such a way that does not fold back on it, the faith and destroys it. The, you know, the stance of the pessimist I mean, the stance of the pessimist is, is a strong stance. I mean, Delaney, Delaney's question doesn't disappear. We haven't, I haven't gotten rid of Delaney in this talk. Delaney's response could be something like the following at the end of the talk. He could have been the first person in this room to raise his hand and say, okay, well, how many more black lives are you willing to sacrifice in, in the name of white Americans becoming something other than what they seem to be in their practices and conduct, question mark. And then he could have rolled out all of the data, right? The economic inequality, um, the wealth gap, the education, he could have rolled it all out. All right? So Delaney doesn't go away. He haunts the faith holders. The question will always be there. But the point is, is that to be the faith holder is always to court the possibility to court the danger that your fellows may in fact say no. They may in fact not affirm, right? And then you have to decide, right? Where are you gonna stand? So let me ask one, add one final thing to this, where are you gonna stand? In 1852, Delaney had a plan. The plan was to pick up black folks and we go elsewhere. In 1852, that seemed viable. There was actually real conversations about the economics that would be involved in this. It seemed viable. It quickly became clear that that was not viable economically, that that would involve displacement of other persons elsewhere, that it would generate all kinds of other problems. It might generate its own form of colonialism by virtue of the displacement of black people. Um, so it wasn't viable, right? 
So it would have taken this stance today, the stance being the pessimistic stance. But we have another a number of scholars who, have take, who take this stance, and they say, so we stop investing energy in trying to transform. Right? A number of academics take this stance. A number of public journalists who are doing quite well for themselves. They sort of stand back, and they, you know, they, they say this is an anti-racist, right? this is sort of anti-black society. That's all to be said about it. There you go. So once you know that, now you can turn your energy towards yourself, and that's it. But what of the black and brown folks that are still trying to get on with living a, a good life? That are trying to flourish, right? It seems to me that this stance, the pessimist stance, is a selfish stance, right? And it often emanates from those who are already in a, in a well-positioned, um, who are already well-positioned, right? And my final note on this, because I know we've got to wrap up, is that it seems to me, and I'm going to invoke Jeff Stout here, it seems to me that in the ascendancy of the Afro-pessimist stance in our contemporary moment, it seems to me that we, that we value and praise the wrong kind of critic. That we seem to, white and black alike, we seem to be drawn to the critic who could deal the fatal blow. Okay? But the point of the social critic is not to deal the fatal blow. The point of the critic is to be like the surgeon. You want the surgeon's incision to be careful, measured, so that at the end of the day, the patient remains whole and intact without, right, without the cancer inside. But we value the wrong kind of critic who, having dealt his or her fatal blow to the nation, would then turn to the rest of us and ask us to cheer knowing that if, in fact, we cheer for this and come to support it, there's a whole lot of folks who are going unattended to, right? Who, whose vision of the good life is going unrealized. So, sorry, I get a little, get a little going on this point. So I tend, to, I tend to reject as false the Afro-pessimist stand precisely because of the kind of posture it would generate in us were we to accept it. And I don't have ultimately the facts on my side. But I stand with the faith holders and I'm okay with that. Thank you.